Okay. So I'm going to start with, let me go back here. I'm going to talk about developing your program. Um, your business site research you'll do, you'll be conducting before you go out there. Um, your logistics, we'll talk about that. Materials and equipment prep. So this is a pre-inspection stuff. Starting with the bottom half, consider developing a standard operating procedures for your program. And the reason is, you can really think through everything so that if something comes up, you're not scrambling. You have this great guidance manual to, to build off of. You, you already saw who else is doing inspections. You can give them a call if you're your neighbor. And um, you can put in there, what are the roles and responsibilities of different folks that are involved with this program? What's the training and the safety required for this program? What training are your inspectors going to need? Um, this is a great time to put together your inspection form. Next, your inspection process. What is that going to look like? How are you going to manage your data? Are you going to use your GIS system? Are you going to use some other internal data management system? Are you going to use uh, Excel spreadsheets? Because I only have 70 something, right? That would be appropriate. Um, and you can think through your progressive enforcement. And when you think through progressive enforcement, you want to know your codes. So you put together your SOPs, you've run it by different management folks, nobody's surprised by anything. Now you can go out and the top part is establish, you can go out with your SOPs in your hand and um, establish relationships and contacts within your organization. For someone in a small organization, you may be, you may be shaking hands with yourself. Right? Code enforcement, is it going to be through your community development department or is code enforcement going to be implemented within your organization? Go talk to your illicit discharge detection and elimination folks. They will be involved with your program. If they get an IDDE report at a business, you want them to know about it. You want them to know who you are so they can make the inspection part of that. Um, compliance for what's going on at the IDEE site. Brian McKinnon is one that told me about that. And I just want to let you know, a lot of this information comes from phase one jurisdictions that have been running these programs for a number of years, um, phase two jurisdictions who run these kinds of programs for other requirements, and the ecology and pollution prevention system. So there's a lot of experience out there that we pulled from and we're bringing to you today. Um, your own M folks, they see a lot out there. So go out there and talk to your own M folks and they'll say, oh yeah, there's this business. Whenever we go clean such and such in this line down there, we see, you know, hanky panky or whatever. So that kind of thing. So when you're thinking about your inspections, you'll think about, are you going to coordinate with other programs? Now, Rebecca talked about there's other folks out there doing inspections. Um, there's the Ecology Pollution Prevention Assistance Program. And that program started out as local source control in 2008, I believe. And that's been going on for a number of years. So if those inspectors have been out there, you want to know where they've been, who they've talked to, what kind of work they've done, and what approach did they take? Do I have a PPA person here? Can you briefly describe PPA's approach to an inspection? Um, I actually just started like two months ah, ago. Ah, okay. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I have another one? She's a good question. Um, you know, it's a technical assistance program, so they walk it in for the salesman. Uh, they're a very white hat program. And they focus on small quantity generators. It is small quantity generators. She says, so I want to repeat, their focus is small quantity generators, but PPA has also gone out and done uh, uh, restaurants and other business sectors now. So they've been around, Brian's nodding. Did you want to add anything, Brian? The, the original question was PPA, describe the difference, what was? Can you describe the PPA approach to an inspection? On paper, it's voluntary. 
you're never going to hear a PPA person tell a, an SQG that it is. I mean, there's still an underlying regulatory tone there, but it is not as forward as source control. Um, you know, we do refer to regulations and not just management practices, mm -hmm. which is a jargon. It's an adjective. It's a, a, an obstacle sometimes because we do have this black and white underlying tone. And we also, beyond just solid and hazardous waste, are looking at uh, stormwater source control. So it's kind of a catch all, a uh, little broader, yeah. on the wind side. Yeah, so I wanted to give you a flavor. And each PPA inspector, I think all, they're all a little different too on their approach. So if you have that, if that program is going on in your jurisdiction, it's either with the county health department, sometimes it's within public works or solid waste. And go to that person and find out what have you been doing, where have you been, what kind of inspections. So it's really good to know. Now, ecology, they go out and inspect sites that have an industrial stormwater permit or a sector permit, like a boatyard permit or something. And so you'll want to coordinate with them because those folks may have been inspected by ecology. And ecology, is through, does, is there anybody from that program here? industrial I didn't really think so so their their inspection is more they look at manifests they look at the paperwork it's it's very in-depth their their inspections they can be very in-depth and they're done less frequently sometimes it's every five years so you can look up if a business has an ecology uh, permit is uh, industrial permit through the Paris database PARIS and you can find out if they have a permit, and then you can decide, do I want to coordinate with ecology? Okay. Now, internally co coordinating, I talked a little bit about IPDE response. Your facility, you have stormwater facility inspectors, right? And so you may want to coordinate with them. Back soils in Greece, those folks get a good look at properties, and they're a good group to um, coordinate with. And then uh, Industrial waste pretreatment, they sometimes get access into larger industrial uh, facilities where there's testing of what they're discharging to the sewer. So that's possible. So what do you see as an advantage of a joint inspection? Does anybody, what's an advantage? Of Right, get it all done at one, one visit and it reduces inspection fatigue. What's a disadvantage to a joint inspection? I was, I was gonna say, uh, different perspectives from two regulators. Yeah, they have two different perspectives. Some are looking at one thing, some are looking at some, something else. Did I hear another one? I said time scheduling, coordinating things together. Time schedule, coordinating, and inspector styles. You may have really different inspector styles. So, um, you know, think about that. The business might also feel like they can be a little Yes, thank you. That was in my notes. Did you hear that? The business feels like they're being ganged up on. Brian. I'd like to add one more to that. Um, experience enforcement too. When enforcement comes to bear, yeah. sometimes it's not the source control specialist. Um, that is responsible for the actual enforcement, meaning you know, the issuance of the citation or something like that. So, mm -hmm. not the, the business having to deal with multiple people is just. Yeah. So, you'll, you know, as you're putting your SOPs together and you're thinking about your program, you'd be kind of weighing these things, talk to your neighbor, kind of talk to folks with experience. If you know someone who's in a phase one jurisdiction, they've been doing this for years. There's the guy from Snohomish County is here at the conference. I saw him earlier. Brad, Brad Wright. Brad Wright. Uh, uh, get his ear. He's, he's really got has great experience. So next I want to talk about your inspection forms. You can develop an electronic form. So you're going to have equipment. You're going to have a computer or a tablet, a, a, you know, that kind of equipment. Connectivity may or may not be an issue if, if you need, you know, to enter it, does it need to go live into the database? Um, or you can use a paper form. Um, 
one of the things about what we heard from experienced inspectors was if you rely so much on your form, you're reducing the, um, the contact and building that relationship with the business site manager or owner. So by relying on the form, it feels very formal, no pun intended, but yeah, it feels very formal. And so if, if the form drops down and you're more having a discussion, it may go a little more smoothly. So that's something to think about forms. So whether you want to go electronic, paper, and I've heard very experienced inspectors say, I don't have a form. I just go back to the truck and fill it out. So, so your inspection form contact, content, you're going to have your site business ID and tracking. What is a good tracking number or identification in your jurisdiction? It's, it's really helpful if it's unique and that it's not going to change over time. Think about that because businesses change, properties get split, all kinds of things happen as you know out there. Anybody have any ideas? You know, what's a really good number to use in your system? Yeah, it's not bad. Your business, the UBI. The UBI. And granted, properties do split. I wish the DOR would require a tax parcel, not a, an address associated with. Can we, can we influence that? Can we influence what the DOR gets from businesses? Sure, go for it, Brian. Can we talk? I go to the county. <laughs> Yeah, that's one. Um, parcel number, is that a good one? Yes. Yeah, parcel number could be a good one. Address has changed. So just think about that. Um, you can confirm your inventory details and activities. What are they doing there at the site? What do you think they're doing there at the site? You can look at Google Maps, get an idea of the extent of their sites and property lines. Oh, that lay down yard in the back, that belongs to these folks, not to these folks, kind of thing. Um, Leave room for the names, inspector names. What type of inspection is it? Initial, routine, or follow-up? You want to keep track of every single one of those inspections. Don't short yourself. You want to get to that 20%. Earn it. So count those, those extra inspections that have to be done. For the social control BMPs, um, it's really great to have the information of if it's um, satisfactory, action needed, or not applicable. And I really like not applicable because you may be gone in a couple of years and someone else goes back to the same site and that not applicable, they're now doing that activity. So they, they brought in a new activity. So that NA, it can be helpful. You can group your uh, form by the areas, indoors, outdoors, or by activities. We have a sample form and it's also in Survey one, two, three, and Word. So um, this is a resource for you guys to use. Leave a placeholder for photos. And obviously at the bottom, a really clear area for your summary of action items. And that'll come in really handy later on. So another pre-inspection activity is to consider what's your approach gonna be of who gets inspected when? It could be geographical. Oh, I'm going to spend the first three, three months inspecting all the prop, all the businesses on my list in Silverdale or my business sector. I'm going to spend the summer. Gosh, where would it be a good place to go spend the summer? Marinas. No. <laughs> but at um, a certain business sector is another one. Or if you have a TMDL, a cleanup plan, or a stormwater management action planning area, an SMAP area. You may want to, you know, say, I'm going to do that first, my priority area. What is another way that you could group where you're going to go? Any ideas? Uh, so right now, I'm just doing single family homes. So getting those off the list. Home businesses. Home businesses. Oh, you're tackling the funnest first. Wow, you're brave. <laughs> what about anybody else? Nick codes. Huh? Nick codes. Nick codes. Do it by season. By season. So, for instance, where we're at, restaurants are very busy in the summer, so we try to do it in the winter. There you go. So, I don't know if everybody heard that. Do it by seasons. 
when they're busy or not, when they're not busy, they're not. like restaurants are busy in the summer, come back in the winter when they're not as busy, they have a little more time. That's very, that's considerate, that's considerate. Another way that some people are prioritizing their list is by risk. They say those properties doing this activity, you know, fueling, washing, you know, they're, they're looking at risk and they say for those doing these higher risk to pollute activities, I'm going to do those first. That's, that's an approach that some folks are taking. Will you notify folks first? Will you send them a, a letter? We're starting this new program. So think about notifying folks first, that group you're gonna go out and inspect. Okay, so now you're gonna do your, I have two slides on doing your free business site research. So you've decided you're going to, you are in Marysville and you're in the land of restaurants. So we have lots of restaurants and you're gonna start with restaurants. And so I'm going to figure out what restaurants to go out and inspect. I'm gonna verify their name, their address, their contact, maybe even hours of operation, make it a little easier. You have to think about who you're going to reach out to when you inspect. Who do you want with you walking the site, doing the site visit? The business owner, the business manager, someone who can make some decisions. So you have to think about that. It, Find a way to see if you're with the right person when you get out there. Um, what's the business type? What are the possible activities they're doing out there? Okay. Is it industrial? Is it manufacturing? Is it restaurant? Is it gas station? What kind of things are they doing out there? Do they have stockpiles? Where are the likely source control BMPs related to the site? Um, so when you think about that, you're thinking about the top, the other two things above it, where the potential pollutant generating sources. So you have some materials with you that they might need to help them get going. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So you're, you, you're doing your research and then you're gonna do a records review. So does the site have an existing stormwater or water quality permit? You go to the Paris database, find out if they have an industrial permit, if they're getting visits from ecology. Um, you can reach out to Ecology and ask them about the site. When was the last time you were there? And they'll say, ah, oh, we haven't been there for 10 years. No offense to Ecology. But, you know, we, we just haven't gotten around to that one. Um, or we were just there last week. I kind of move them down your list if you want to. Um, are there records of previous inspections? This is where when you went and shook hands with the, your FOG folks, your ONF, your facility folks, are there any records of previous inspections, insights people can give you about that property? Um, is there a water quality complaint history or IDVE records? Well, you know, someone from IDVE may say, oh yeah, I was out there about three months ago and there was some real, you know, real issues and they need a lot of help. So it's, it's really great to get that ahead of time, that, that intel. Um, are there any on-site drainage as built available? A lot of folks have mapped the private systems within their GIS. So if you're able, like Jeff at Kitsap County can easily print out a map of where their CVs are, where their, their, all their structures are, and boy, they sure appreciate it. Because when you're talking to them, and we'll talk about this a little later, and you tell them, you know, one of the housekeeping things that needs to be done is you need to have your system clean. CVs are full. And so here's a map and you can, and I'll walk through a little later about how you can really, really help these folks. Giving them a map is great. It shows them where their system is, provides education. Some of them are new owners. And they're like, I had no idea I had a stormwater system, you know, so you do a, a lot of help there. Okay, materials and equipment. So now you're getting ready to go out there. You have your SOPs, you've introduced yourself internally to folks, pulled your form together, you have your inventory, you've decided on either a sector or activities that they're doing and you're starting, you're gonna go out there pretty soon. So you can have your documents, of course your business cards, your outreach materials, 
your files, your maps, your records, maybe even a clipboard, safety equipment, your usual public works, public health, safety equipment, hard hat, boots, safety vest. Thank you, Pat, for the picture. Um, leather gloves, latex gloves if you need it, hearing protection if you're in a, a manufacturing or industrial area. And there's other inspection equipment that you'll need in your truck for doing a business inspection. What are some things, so what are some other things besides what's on this list that, you, that you'll carry in your vehicle? Manhole lifter. Over here, yeah. Sediment probe. Sediment probe, your probing rod. In your hat. What? Mm -hmm. Your teeth, teeth. Yeah. Flashlight. Flashlight. Now, hint on flashlights. You get out a big, bulky flashlight, it feels really intrusive. Like, and you're looking down in there and like, whoa, you know, this person, wow, they're just looking at everything. Just one of those little ones that are really good. Stick it in your pocket. You just pull out and say, oh, I just wonder where this piping goes and whatnot. Little flashlight. Yeah. What? Huh? Yeah. Camera with the what turned on? Time date, Time date stamp. Got to keep good records. And I'll tell you later why it's so beneficial to keep good records. What else? A mirror to inspect the uh, I love it. A mirror to inspect like the, the pipes. outlet pipes. Yeah. yeah. I don't have that on my list. Thank you. A new one. What about if you have time and you say, you wonder, where does this indoor sump go? Dye. Dye. You might want to carry some dye. Um, you may, maybe sample bottles, maybe some chem strips. You see some funky discharge and it doesn't feel like you're invading their space too much. Take a pH. Oh, you're doing granite cutting. So those are some of the other things. I think you guys got them all. Uh, shovel or rake. Oftentimes you're uncovering part of their storm system that they didn't even know was there. Bring a shovel or a rake. So those are your pre-inspection activities. Yes. I would suggest traffic cones. I want to get out of there. Yeah, you know, I didn't have them there, but yeah, I think traffic cones would be a really good idea. You know, if you're working around an area and there's some vehicular traffic and you want to look at something particular, I think that's a really good idea. Excellent. Okay, what do you guys think? You feel ready? Okay, I'm gonna talk about the safety check, the all important at the door, engaging the business owner manager. We're gonna go through and, and do general talk about site walkthrough and documentation, inspection closeout, and then after our exercise and our mock inspection, I will talk about enforcement, okay? Okay, so, you know, back to safety, the appropriate PPE. Um, just look at precautions, warnings, look at traffic. If there's active traffic, trucks going by, loading, unloading activities. Um, and for a larger site, like an industrial site, they, you, you want to be cognizant. They might have a site, say, site, sorry, there's a lot of S's, a site-specific safety plan. So just be aware. So, at the door, the friendly introduction. Find something when you walk in. Okay, let's say you've sent the letter and you walk in the door and say, you know, hi, my name is Jeff Goodwin. I'm from Kitsap County. And I sent you a letter. Did you see my letter a couple weeks ago? And it's about this new program. And I'm here, um, you know, it's for clean water and it's for your site and that the runoff from your site is as clean as it can be, um, entering our, the storm system that then enters Clear Creek and, and into Dyes Inlet. And so they'll say, oh yeah, I got that letter. I didn't read all of it, but um, yeah, I got that letter. <clears throat> and then maybe you have some connection with this business. Hey, I got my car fixed here about a year ago. You guys did a great job. Or, I, I come to this nursery all the time. I give you half my paycheck. You know, it's just, you know, you can probably find something um, if you want. If it's in your personality, we all have different inspector personalities. And so um, you can do that. 
start with that friendly introduction um, and, and then ask, is the owner, manager, or you know, site manager, are they here? Um, I, I, I want to walk the site with them. Um, and someone you know, who can make decisions and, and implement things if something needs to be changed or modified. So that's, that's a good way to do that. The purpose of your program, this program is about clean water. It's about what rainwater hits and what it carries to the storm drain system from your activities and your site. And we're just gonna be walking around, visiting, taking a look. Um, and it's all about clean water downstream. Let them know right away what the time commitment is. This person's running a business. And so you'll get the hang of it, like restaurants, it's gonna take me 15 minutes, 25 tops. Or you're at a very complicated site. I think landscaping and nurseries can be complicated. Um, anybody doing a lot of multiple high-risk activities. So if you have peeling, washing, stockpiles, <clears throat> contain, you know, storing hazardous waste kind of stuff, a lot of barrels and drums, there's a lot to look at. A lay down yard, I'd say, well, you know, probably about an hour. Is now a good time or should I come back? You know, want to make an appointment. So that time commitment. If you start to feel like you're getting a refusal, it's okay. You know, um, they get inspected for a lot of other things. They start to kind of get the body language. Always keep the door open. You can say something like, here's my card, circle your phone number, give me, give me a call when you're ready for, an, for a site visit. You can, if you want to soften your language a little bit, and the other thing is, um, I would say when I was leaving, I just want you to know that I'm going to be visiting all the auto shops in your area. Well, you know, and this happened to me, I had a refusal in an auto shop and I left with that statement. And about a month later, later I got a phone call and he, he said, yeah, I was having coffee with the other auto shop owners. And they said, oh, that lady from the county, she wasn't so bad. You know? So it's a fairness thing. I'm visiting all of them in this area with you know, all the landscape with all this. And so they, they don't feel so picked on. The example letter in the guidance manual, this is based on the brochure developed by Snohomish County. I saw that brochure and I was like, they nailed it. So the letter says, it starts with in bold, we want to partner with you. And so, you know, some people only read all the bold. So if they only read the bold, it says we want to partner with you. Reminder, only rainwater should enter the storm drain. What will happen if problems are found? Those are the three bold items. And then there's all the gobbledygook underneath if they want to read all the details. So it's what, do you, what to expect. This is about education, providing technical assistance, and there is, um, uh, uh, compliance uh, arm to this. Excellent. We have even more on this because this is this is a big part. I already heard the person say what I really want you all to get out of this by the end is you're building relationships. Someone already said that. So when well, you get refused, but <clears throat> you like suspect that they have issues going on. They have issues, yeah, they have issues, like you're seeing some pretty, yeah. yeah. Then what would you do? What would I do? Yeah. I would go back and talk to other people in my office and ask about like, so I would get a few heads together, like, well, what do you think we should do? Do we have any <clears throat> angles we can use here? Yeah, I think. Don't want to go rogue. And again, we don't want to start a war. So it's, you know, get some heads together and someone will say, oh, that's my brother's best friend. I mean. We all live in these smaller communities, so there might, there's, there's usually ways, there's usually ways. I can sell water to a plant, so that's what I've been told. Um, so engaging the business owner, remember, you're focusing on what comes in contact with rainwater. And I like, there's two ways to do this, is to ask them to give you a guided tour of what they do there. These folks are proud of what they've built. 
And so they're giving you a tour. Another way is to start two ways with the drainage system. Start down at the catch basins, what the purpose of the catch basins are and the storm system, where the water goes, goes out to a pipe, out to the road, down there, and then it ends up in Clear Creek and Dice Inlet. Or you can start with their activities and you end the inspection at the storm drains. So they can start to see the flow of the material and, and what you're talking about. Because not everybody knows that water flows downhill. It's crazy. So a couple, couple approaches. So the recommended areas to inspect, outdoor storage areas, including stockpiles and dumpsters, fueling areas, a lot of issues with fueling areas, you're going to run into a lot of washing issues. And we'll talk a little bit about more about that in a minute. And vehicle equipment maintenance areas. So you set up your form, you're asking them about those different activities and those different areas, and they'll get you to those areas, or you have them give you the guided tour. The other areas are indoor maintenance and storage areas. Why would I want to look at indoor maintenance and storage areas? Two reasons. One is I'm sneaky. If I see space where they could move an outdoor storage or activity to indoors, I'm like, oh, you've got some space over here. You can move that activity indoors, which would be better. The second reason is what they're doing in there, if you look at the slope of the concrete running out, right into the driveway and down into the storm drain. So things going on in that area on, at those bays could be flowing out. Um, you're gonna look at their storm drainage system, their BNP facilities, and then activities that are unique to the site that generate leads. Loading and loading areas, um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Marina dock washing, there's actually a video by the Port of Seattle that Marilyn Guthrie did that's really, she didn't, she couldn't find anything about dock washing. And so she created a video for dock washing and what to do. It's pretty cool. And any other unusual kind of activities. So a couple of slides, what to look for. Rebecca talked about stockpiles a little bit. Um, I think we talked about the catch basins, whether the material is erodible right? It's really fine sandy material in that stockpile, and it's going during the rains, it's going to erode. Tarp it. Um, anything else on stockpiles that anybody wants to contribute, what to look for? We already talked a bit about those. Dumpsters. Dumpsters are always neat and tidy and perfect, don't they? What's the problem? It's open. Lids open, because then rainwater enters and fills it up. Plugs removed. I had one guy who removed the plugs so that when they had their mop water, their employees would carry the mop water over to the dumpster and pour it in the dumpster so it would sweeten up the smell. And it wouldn't smell so bad. This is a fast food restaurant. And, but if you pull the plug out, then it just drains out the pond and you just sweep it up your dumpster. If it's leaking, what do you tell them? If their dumpster is old, it's got some rust, and it's all waste dumpster. management to have it replaced. Do we have any waste management staff attending? <laughs> <laughs> so it is amazing, you guys. This is like where you can really get some credibility. Uh, just call waste management and ask them to replace it. They'll replace it within a week. And it's true. They, I don't know if it's in their contract with their solid waste divisions or what. Is that what it is? It's required with the next slide. Okay. Boom. Well, just don't tell, you know, you don't tell the, rent, the property owner that. But you look like God. You know, it's like, oh, I called and it was replaced within a week. So get that replaced. Um, outdoor storage areas, anything that they're storing out there. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And waste handling and disposal. So uh, recycling bins, garbage bins. If they have garbage bins with the 
open racks on them. They gotta cover those because water is entering those. What are those called? Grapes, metal grapes. Have you seen those? They gotta cover those. You know, just some simple structural BMPs and be installed. So you're gonna be really clear about those housekeeping items. Number one, if you pressure wash the outside of it with soap and everything, you're gonna to have to collect that water and dispose of it in the interior drain. Number two, you're gonna to have to keep the outside clean and educate your employees not to miss the door that it goes into. And it does. And it does, it's dripping all over outside. If it's overflowing, you it's your responsibility to call and get that hauled more frequently because you're generating more than yeah so it's you're gonna have to be really clear on those shared with the problem also. and oh know. it's shared with two other restaurants it's in our more. and it's it's all their fault but not yes. ours i said well guess what you know and, and if it's that property has three restaurants and there's a property owner or property management company. This is a really common issue. I get a lot of questions and we talk a lot about when do you involve that property person, right? That property owner. They're responsible too. So we can talk about this later. It's when you go to send out those letters, send them to everybody. The property owner, property management, you know, if you feel like this needs to be addressed. Yeah. So I hope that answered it. Yeah, restaurants. Um, you're going to look for equipment and vehicle washing. What is the ideal vehicle washing system? Yeah, wash rack, covered, trash rack, empties the sewer, all that good stuff. You're going to run, I think, for those who have started already, you're probably going to run into a lot of folks who don't know about washing don't know that soapy water entering the storm drain is not allowed. Hey, I'm using this soap. It's biodegradable. It's environmentally friendly. And I always tell them, no soap. All soap kills fish. It's really simple. All soap kills fish. So you can't do this. Let's find another way. Let's find something in the interim, right? Let's find a jerry rig until we can get it perfect. Because, you know, stay in business. So what are some of the jerry rigs, the interim kind of things you could do for vehicle washing? What could they do until they get like the gold star system? Go to a car wash. Go to a car wash. What else? I gotta keep my fleet clean. I gotta look good when I go out to people's houses and do estimates. Put in, block the catch basin and collect the water with a sump pump and put it in an interior drain. They also make, um, I think it's at those safety supply companies. I can't remember who, who makes them, but they're like a tray with a little wall. You yeah. drive your vehicle up on them and then wash and then you can suck that water up. So that's another one. They can wash on grass. Ecology actually is okay with that, but there's a limit of how many over the weeks before that grass gets saturated and then pukes out the soap. So I just am not a real fan of that one. Washing on gravel is not acceptable. Even though we feel like oh, gravel, it just brings through gravel, it'll be okay. You're gonna run into a lot of washing. Hood filters, ducts, and bands. This is a wonderful picture from Heather Martin from the city of Kent. And she has like a whole library of really gross pictures. And it's where there's been grease filled up, uh, up, up on the roof, plug the roof drains, flooding, um, the interior ducts and fans are also, these professional companies come in and clean those, scrape off the grease, and so we have a handout about these kinds of activities and that the property, the business is responsible for when that contractor comes in and does the work, make sure that contractor knows they have to dispose of that stuff properly. What are your thoughts on 
car wash can dip the catch basin drains to a retention pond. I have a very specific thought. <laughs> what I say is, you know, that's that's really great, but this this pond is not designed to collect, collect and treat a large concentration of pollutants. It's really meant for neighborhood runoff. And so that pollutant, under certain conditions, that pond can just move the pollutants right up to the outlet. So Jeff, do you have anything to add to that? I know you no. did own in and all that, yeah. 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 It's all right out. If it's raining real hard, it'll bypass and just exit. And so that's not what that pond was designed for. What about like on site filtration? Like uh, perforated pipe or something? Yeah, like a trench system. Yeah. I would look up ecology's rules. I would look up the BMPs, the source control BMPs, and see if that, that will pass the SNP test. Yeah. Did I see another hand? I was just going to mention uh, you brought the ash sheet with that. Uh, They can seal them and repair them. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, hmm. I'd go back and reinspect on that one to make sure. Yeah, yeah I had not heard that. Um, so this is another thing is when I talk about indoor vehicle maintenance space, indoor storage areas, indoor floor cleaning, looking at what's going on indoors, what's going on in this picture? Water. Yeah, it's just so easy to take that mop water and throw it out the back door and have it just roll away and it's gone. So yeah, just look for those kinds of staining on the pavement, um, those activities and ask them, what do you do with your mop water? Do you have a, a mop sink? Um, thank you, Heather Martin, for that picture. And then another thing to look for is evidence of past spills. So staining in the um, parking lot. Hey, I see there's a lot of pavement corrosion here. 
you know, um, maybe there's some things going on that's corroding the pavement with a lot of leaks and oil spills and, um, you know, what, what could be done about that? Because that then ended up with the storm drain. So what's going on here? Dams leaking big time. They put down their diatomaceous earth or kitty litter, blocked off the catch basin. And then, you know, sometimes when you walk up on these kinds of situations, they don't pick up the litter for a long time and then it rains. So it's just kind of like, ah, oh, when this happens, don't forget to clean up your spill right away, restock your spill kit. Um, do you have a spill plan? This is where you can really provide a lot of um, assistance, technical assistance because spills happen. And it's to let them know, yeah, we know it's not like we're gonna come and get mad at you about a spill. These things happen. Have a plan, have a kit, train your employees, and, you know. What would you consider for, like, proper employee training? What would you want to do? Oh, boy. Does anybody else want to answer that? <clears throat> Ryan? For, for, like, what, for, for, for spills. Right? Training. What's proper employee training? What would you consider? It's, uh, you know, I used to give out, and it's probably still out there, just a two page up called like a, a tailgate, almost safety briefing, right? But the way I would pitch it is I'd hang it on the manager and say, look, it's all going to come back to you. So do you want to know if it's a drop? Because we all know what a drop of oil in a puddle of water looks like, perception wise. It's a cup. Ecology is going to come knock on your door, and so do you, do you want that? No, the best way around that is to educate your employees so that, number one, you're aware of it, and then you can uh, implement the spill response. I mean, granted, I often say that the manager has a half day on a Friday, and he's at home, and the spill happens when he's at home, so you still want to know about it, and that is the emphasis of the plan, which is also the training. Yeah. Which also points out where the kid is, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And then it's like, how often do you have employee meetings or safety meetings? And this is a great topic. Okay. And I'd love to come and talk to your staff about it. We have a, we have, we do a, a annually a state patrol comes and does it for us. And we have awareness and operations level. Uh huh. So anybody who's pulling standby for a, a city, uh, you have at least an awareness training on it, and then you can call an operations level guy in to assess it better. But basically, anything over five gallons is what we were told. It's, it's you're calling DOE to come respond to anything someone has it. Right. We all have that stepwise in the permit when you call, you know, if it's going to leave the site, if imminent rain, you know, that kind of thing, just that whole stepwise procedure. But, uh, it's good to get out of your comfort zone. Like I used to do PGA visits at fire departments. Now there's some curveballs because when they respond to wrecks on the road, um, they're dealing with state patrol too. So let's say you know that there are beer bottles or something involved. They would shovel up all the kitty litter, all the beer bottles that were maybe on the side of the road to begin with, and shove it all into the truck or car or vehicle that was getting towed away. Well, once state patrol is like, well, there are all these beer bottles and there's all this stuff, which wasn't in the actual vehicle that wrecked, that kind of put a damper on how the fire departments were responding to it. So oh. there are these kind of peripheral agencies that, you know, I would consider partner agencies that are worthy to reach out to and, and talk to them about how they're managing this stuff. And they're going to push back uh, yeah. a little bit, but um, there's some wonky stuff going on out there too. So yeah. And talk about partnering specifically the smaller cities. Several of them have said, we're partnering with our police department. We're partnering with our fire department because they're so small. It's, it's easier to do. So this is where you can make a lot of headway. So what's going on in this picture? Yeah. They have a filter sock in there, so that's they have a clean site. Everything's clean, leaving their site. Except they're not changing the sock. Um, yeah, it's it's a discussion. So get educated about filter socks, what your response is about filter socks, when they're appropriate, when they're not appropriate, um, and their proper use. So then the problem is is when they go to take those out, something falls in. Yeah. Lift it up correctly so everything is caught is still okay. 
Yeah. So then they're like, well, put the sock out. It's like, well, well then have, everything fell down inside the factory. Yeah. And that was really useful. Yeah, it's heavy. Oh, yeah. It's heavy. Yeah. So looking at the catch basins, I think probably 99% of people in this room know the rule about your probe, how much sediment is when, when it tells you that this needs cleaning. 60% full or six inches below the invert. So, you know, and, and educate them. They can go and decide when they need uh, maintenance or better yet, Encourage them to get on a routine maintenance plan with a local maintenance provider. Wouldn't that be great? Well, if everybody was doing that, look at their treatment and flow control BMPs and facilities if you want. If you want to start lifting lids and looking inside, look at oil, you know, those older ones where you have oil water separators. Do they have those oil socks in there that have been in there for five years, never change them? That kind of thing. And maybe educate them on how, you know, that vault works, that API vault works. So things like that, you have a real opportunity. So you've done your inspection. You've walked the site, you've recorded everything, and you're going to close it out. And so you want to verify that, you know, who do I send this information to? Email, contact information. How would you like to receive it? Do you want it via letter? Can I just send you an email? Attach the information to the email. Um, so get that hammered out at that point. Provide technical assistance materials for specific action items. This is your great opportunity to say, hey, here's this, walk them through it. I always recommend if I'm gonna give somebody a brochure, I'm gonna open the brochure, I'm gonna take out my pen or marker and I'm gonna circle things. I'm gonna invite them into the brochure and highlight things. So that for sure just doesn't sit somewhere. They're like, oh yeah, she showed me this, she showed me that, and these are the things I need. And here's a phone number, call me, that kind of thing. You're gonna give them materials. This is a great opportunity to give them a list of service providers for maintaining their system. Get that list put together. We don't recommend a certain one, but they have that right in front of them. And you can also give them a little advice on how to get a quote to get their system clean. Um, and then you're going to discuss the next steps and we'll talk about this more, but the more experienced you become, the more, when you walk a site, you'll start ticking off in your head, the higher priority items, the things that need to be taken care of today, the things that need to be taken care of in the next 30 days. And then maybe longer term items that are the nice to haves that could give a reason for you to come back and maintain and foster that relationship. So you're going to, as you do more of these inspections, you're going to start ticking those things off about what the corrective actions are, what kind of timeline. But at first, it's, it's going to take some trial and error. You know, how long is it going to take to get um, the wet compactor replaced. I know from experience, it takes a long time. Another thing is if I'm dealing with a big box store, they want a pretty nasty letter right away so that it goes up to corporate and that cover gets built. Where with a mom and pop place, I'm gonna work with them a little more. So you'll start getting these um, intuition kind of things going on. And you wanna tell them what to expect. I'm going to be sending you a letter. I'm going to be sending you an email. It's going to say these things. It's going to give a list. It's going to give a timeline. And if you're having any issues with that, you know, please give me a call anytime. And I'll be back about the first week of next month. And I might give you a phone call beforehand to find out how's it going and getting this fixed or that fixed or if you're having any issues. I didn't talk about secondary containment. I missed it. I am so sorry. I think you're going to see a lot of folks who need secondary containment. And that's where they're storing liquids, materials on site, usually in drums or the big square carboys. And 
they're going to need containment decks for if that drum splits, if that carboy leaks, tips over, whatever. And so the containment rule, does anybody know it off the top of their head what they're going to need? 110% of the largest container there, or 10% of the total volume of storage. Right. And we have a handout that makes it very clear what they're going to need. Now, containment decks are not cheap. So that's something they're going to have to pony up a little bit of money for. It needs to be covered also. And it needs to be covered. Because before you had the drums, but there's no covers. So I ain't saying that. So I thought that was later. But you can't put secondary containment for when the rain hits and then whatever sheds is overflowed. So when your secondary containment fills up, it's not going to be good. So it needs to be covered. And they make the ones with those roll covers, but those are twice as expensive. So they can build just a simple roof somewhere off the side, like an awning. She says, you got to be careful what they're storing because then you're dealing with the fire department, what can be what next to what, and what needs to be in a, a cabinet and all that stuff. This was what I felt when I was out there was dangerous waste was not my, I just didn't like, I couldn't fathom all of that, what all the rules were. So I went to people in the SQG program and asked them for their advice and brought them in on labeling what's next to what, what has to be in what kind of container. If they're working with solvents and flammables and I was like, I wasn't, I didn't feel schooled enough. If you're ever uncomfortable out there, reach out to other folks to get some help. You know, reach out to your neighbors, reach out to solid waste program, SQG program, call ecology. Yeah, so if you're feeling a little uncomfortable about something. So that's secondary containment. I wanted to make sure I covered that. Anything else? I know we covered a lot. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I like have this pipe very good set up by to like somehow just grease the wheels or I know it's enforcement, but you know, in the, in the long gone era perhaps of EPA, we had a tic tac, a spill kit. Like, hey, here's a spill kit, do a spill plan, but um, I, I think the medium to long range success of programs like source control of EPA. It really be driven by a small incentive for businesses. And maybe I should couch them as ratepayers, um, not just businesses. And say, like, okay, you know, this is going to happen once every three years. If you call ahead to schedule uh, with a specialist, maybe you get a discount. Maybe you get 20% off. Uh, so, yeah. so, you know, yeah. something, maybe, maybe your stormwater fee is reduced per year. You know, because um, at the end of the day, most of us are dealing with business. So, yeah, um, yeah. there's, there's, if that, those are the discussions you have in, with your management and your decision makers, because there's always that gifting of public funds issue. There's, you know, it's part of doing business. All of these rules. So it's, it's kind of, you know, what's your approach going to be? Folks have incentivized it with providing free spill kits or a coupon or some uh, cost share for containment. I think some folks have talked about that. So that's, that's some options. So you've done your inspection, you've prioritized things that are going on out there and you've closed out your inspection. You let them know, hey, you have a contact at the city. If you ever have any other questions, well, I may not be able to answer it, but I can get you maybe to the right person. Um, so you've got a resource. So you're closed out your inspection. You let them know what to expect in the follow-up. <coughs> so you can go back to the office, update the information and the data, whatever data management system you're using. You're going to record and communicate your inspection results with a summary letter or an email. A lot of folks are going to emails because you simply can attach those BMP sheets if you want to. Um, and it's really easy and fast that way. Or a formal letter if you'd like to on your letterhead. You're going to notify the sites that have achieved compliance. 
document actions needed, set timelines. Maybe you set some timelines in person, but you may want to think a little more about the timelines. And then always, always offer your assistance. Set calendar reminders for follow-up inspections if needed. So technical assistant educational materials, we talked a lot about that. Those materials you can provide to folks, any additional support or maybe short-term fixes to, to pressing issues, like we talked about washing. Um, that yin and that yang, like Raheem was talking about, minor versus major issues. You start being able to parse those out, what needs to be addressed sooner versus later, and then start the enforcement process if needed. You can always contact Ecology and reach out to them if needed. Um, when you go through your whole documentation and um, notification process, you've documented everything really clearly. The permit language states you have you can refer a site to Ecology. We have that if you want to go that way. Just to let you know that's in there. Okay, so I'm going to go through some compliance examples. There's a Visio diagram in the guidance manual that, so this is just example, your, your compliance or enforcement process may be different. The blue squares are your inspector decision. So blue square is where the, the inspector is making a decision. You go to this auto shop, they do everything right. They contain, they cover, they capture, and they are cleaning up a spill. They're a-okay perfect. So, You've done, they're in compliance, and you're gonna send them a thank you very much letter and let them know that you're always available if they wanna give you a call at some point. They aren't always like that, are they? So, the out of compliance example is you're going to be providing technical assistance and education probably at the site. And this is the inspector decision portion. You did decide is this high severity or low severity and the difference between those two is a low severity is something that they can fix and you don't need to do a follow-up visit and they could actually just take a photo and send it to you that say they are missing a spill kit they can send a photo oh we went and got a spill kit purchased one and we set it up here remember that spot we recommended sent you a photo so it's very low severity. So for that low severity, you provide technical assistance and education. That's enough. You know, maybe it's training, training their staff. You gave them some resources, you gave them some posters for their restaurant or some posters for employee training and for uh, an auto shop. And then you send that over they can post that up, send you a photo, and you send them a compliance letter. Now, if it's high severity, there's a difference between if there's an ongoing illicit discharge or there's no discharge, but there's all these other issues. And the majority of these sites are going to be no discharge, but all these other issues. All the things we've talked about, housekeeping 101, stockpile, dumpsters, all those different things. You're going to send, you could send, this is your option, is a corrective action letter. This letter doesn't say violation. It doesn't say you're out of compliance. It's, hey, these are, this is that bulleted list of items that we talked about at the closeout of the inspection. And here are the ways, the things that, um, that, that need to be done. And here's the timeline. And maybe you have different timelines for different items because some things may take longer than others. Okay. So that corrective action letter, I'm suggesting 30 days for making the corrective actions. It can be whatever you want. And then you're gonna go out and do a follow-up inspection. They took care of everything, looks really good. They're in compliance and you send them that compliance letter, okay? So here's another thing that'll happen. You'll go out there and they're still not complying. They're still, it's still, you know, it's just one of those sites they are kind of slow to get on board. So you have an option. You send them a corrective action letter, look at your code, get familiar with your code, 
work through your SOPs and decide, do you want to go to a notice of violation and use the B word? Now, the thing about the B word is I prepare people for that. You're going to get this letter. It's going to say notice in order to correct violation. And you'll see me. And um, some places, like I said, the big box stores, they go, send us that letter right away. Because that way I'll send it up to headquarters and they'll get that cover built kind of thing. So they have, they can appeal it in NLCB in the code that I was working in. They have the option to appeal or if they don't appeal, do the more follow-up inspections, nothing is done. And an option is to refer it to your city attorney office or they fixed everything and they're in compliance. If they appeal, go to hearing examiner. I've asked phase one jurisdictions, how many times do you get to the orange box or the yellow box? And they say like one in a thousand. Very, very infrequent because you're working with them, you've built that relationship. It's just very infrequent. So just want to give you that as an option. Now, if there's a discharge, you're gonna go your IDPE route. And you've been doing that for several years now. So you got this down. You're gonna issue a citation. You're gonna follow up with your IDPE enforcement protocols. And you guys have been practiced in that. So whiz bang on that one. 